What's happening, people? Welcome back to another episode of the Athletes to Athletes podcast. Wrestling fans, our favorite time of the year. This week, thousands of us, myself included, will take the trip to the NCAA tournament to watch history be made in the 2023 NCAA Wrestling Championships. And this year, it all goes down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The year has been filled with a ton of action, just like any other year, and it all culminates on the stage on Saturday night. To get an inside look at what it's like to step on the final stage, I chat with NC State's NCAA champion, Michael Machiavello, who made his way to the top of the podium in 2018. We also dig into how he became a wrestler, as well as the habits he created to earn the crown at 197 pounds just a few years ago. So as always, I appreciate you listening to the A2A podcast. I hope you enjoy today's conversation. So welcome back to the A2A podcast. Today I'm joined by probably one of my, my favorite humans on the planet, like not even just athletes. Mike Mock is is one of my favorite people. Every time I see you, it's a handshake and a hug um, and and nothing. And it's funny because you being the, the bear of a wrestler that you are, people would expect you to be mean or whatever else, but like you're one of the most gentle dudes that I've ever met. Mike Machiavello on with me today, uh, NCAA champion. Mock, I'm really happy that you're joining me. Um, and as always, I like to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves and kind of give a little bit of background. So I'm going to give you the floor here before we get into today's conversation. Cool. Yeah. So like you said, my name is Mike Machiavello. Everybody calls me Mock for short. Um, I'm from the state of North Carolina. I was born and raised. I was born in Mecklenburg County, grew up in Union County, which is like 20, 30 minutes outside of Charlotte. And, um, yeah, I've been playing sports my whole life. Uh, ended up wrestling in college, and I moved to Raleigh to uh, wrestle at NC State for my college career, and uh, did well there. Now I'm still wrestling at the senior level, so third on the U.S. national team and an Olympic hopeful. So going to finish out this 2024 Olympic cycle, and yeah, so that's just kind of what I do now. Yeah, um, you know, I I know you as a wrestler, and everyone knows you as a wrestler, NCAA champion. But what other sports did you play growing up? So soccer was actually the first sport I picked up. And and then I picked up football after that in about fifth grade. So I played running back and DB. And then I picked up wrestling in like eighth grade. Did half a season. First full season was freshman year of high school. And then in high school, I did all three. So I played soccer for a club, club team um, that traveled. Uh, in the spring, in the winter, obviously would wrestle, and then in the fall, be, in the fall and summer, I'd be playing football. Yeah. So what what made you want to become an athlete in the first place? You know, some people have you know siblings and stuff like that 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 kind of push them into it. What was it about sports that made you gravitate towards that community? Yeah. So to be honest, it's actually a funny story. My mom, I think, was overwhelmed with the amount of energy I had as a kid. <laughs> Yo, I was off the wall. I think I was like a nut job. I must have been. I, there's no doubt in my mind she'd be crying trying to figure out what am I going to do with this kid because he is all <laughs> over the place. He doesn't listen. He's got a mind of his own, you know. And so I think genuinely from what she's told me, um, she had no aspirations for me to be doing what I'm doing now. She always wanted academics first and job security, all this other stuff. It's the only reason she put me in athletics is because she needed to, me to be less overwhelming for her whenever she got home and she needed me to listen to her. So she put me in soccer because it was the most running around I could do at that age. <laughs> and so that's basically how I started. And I, and I actually fell in love with soccer. I mean, I played it since I was four all the way to my senior year of high school. And uh, we'll still warm up with it now in the wrestling room, you know, and I, it's so it's it's a fun sport for me. It's something that I've always enjoyed doing and I've just had passion for. So but yeah, so that's kinda how I started the sports journey. And then in my neighborhood, uh, there was like quite a bit of kids that were around my age. And so mm -hmm. man, we used to just compete all the time. We would play pickup football. We had this big old field in the neighborhood, no pads, nothing, and we're trying to lay each other out. We play pickup basketball. 
wiffle ball, street hockey. I mean, that's what we did all day, every day. And we would get in arguments. You know, sometimes it would escalate to where we're trying to fight each other over a score, you know. But that's just what we did, man, it was just sports. And that's just that's just what I, I've always done in my whole life. And so that's kind of how I got into it. And then it just continued to build a love for sports and competition with my friends, you know, growing up whenever we had time to go outside and hang out. Mm -hmm. So as you progressed and you said you played all three sports in, in high school, um, yep. but how did you, how did you narrow it down to just one once you got to college and, you know, were you getting recruited for any other sports besides wrestling? Yeah. So it was actually a really, really tough decision for me. So I had a goal. I wanted to get a scholarship offer for all three sports. That's what my goal was. So in football, um, but I also had a goal and dream of being a division one athlete mm -hmm. for a major university. Um, and in soccer, my freshman year, I went to UNC Chapel Hill soccer ID camp and I did all right. I remember there was a JUCO college coach that came up to me and talked to me while I was a freshman in high school. And, um, that really never – I never really had, like, college opportunity for soccer. I, that was just the only one I remember. And uh, then when it came to football, our football team was pretty good. We had several kids that were D1 athletes. We had – one of my teammates had the highest spark rating, which is, like uh, – it's a combine rating. Essentially, you had the, the mm -hmm. Nike high school football combine that would do, be held throughout the country, and they had this thing called the spark rating. So one of my high school teammates, Jody Fuller, had the highest spark rating at the Charlie Nike Spark Combine. He had over like 20, 25 Division I college offers. Uh, he was like the number 22 wide receiver ranked by ESPN. We had my my classmate, Kevin Saxton, who went to App State his freshman year as a quarterback, then transferred to a D3 school and was a record. He's a record holder, and he broke a lot of records for them, was an All-American for them, and now he's coaching. and. He's done a, a fellowship with the Kansas City Chiefs, and Andy Reid mm -hmm. has reached out to him before. And, you know, so we had a pretty – Sam Howe was a quarterback for my high school team after I graduated. His father actually wrestled at App State and was an mm -hmm. NCAA qualifier at heavyweight. And so for those of you who don't know, that's a little, little uh, quick fact. Uh, Sam Howe, who plays for the Washington Commanders, who is projected to be the starter for them next year, his father was a D1 wrestler at App State University and was an NCAA qualifier heavyweight for them. And so, um, but, uh, but yeah, so then it was football. And we always had just deep roots in Union County for football. Football is well known in Union County. People come out all the time. It's just this huge event on Friday nights and people love it. And then wrestling mm -hmm. was just something I did to be a better football player. I mean, that's just really how I got into it. They just convinced me like, hey, this will make you a better football player. I was like, all right, I'm not wearing the tights, but I'll do it, you know. And, <laughs> and then so then I wrestled my first wrestling match in shorts and a T-shirt and felt so out of place. I wore the singlet my next match, but um, that's just kind of how I got into it. And then ended up All-American, being an All-American twice at Flow Nationals by junior and senior in high school and got recruited to some D1 schools. Nothing crazy. Bucknell, UVA. NC State was the first program to reach out to me. Shout out to Frank mm -hmm. Beasley, the guy who found me and recruited me. And, uh, yeah, that was really it, man. So, and then I remember taking a visit to UVA and unofficial. I took an official to Bucknell. I took an official to NC State. UVA was no longer interested for whatever reason. Um, guess it wasn't good enough. <laughs> it goes back to, <laughs> back to the story, you know. And then uh, – uh, was uh went to ended up choosing NC State just because I loved the size of the university and I'd always had aspirations to be an athlete at a big school and that mm -hmm. was my only avenue that was my only way to do it you know because I wasn't getting major D one football offers and so I was like all right looks like I'm gonna wrestle and that's how I decided yeah so yeah I mean it it sounds like wrestling kind of just found you right like that was that was more so what it was like you fell in love with it a little bit after that and um. But you had your growing pains, right? You you get to oh, NC man. State, and it was not it was not easy. I mean, I, I looked up your stats; it was under five hundred. <laughs> you know, it, it just wasn't looking yeah. like the mock that we now know we're sitting with today, right? So, yeah, 
let's dig into those growing pains. What was it yeah. like when you first got on campus, not just as an athlete, but also academically? How are you handling yeah. this brand new world of athletics and academics on this huge campus that, that brought you in? Yeah, so academically, uh, I, I did fine. Um, I think academics is something that I did pretty well at. I, I probably could have put more effort in – and, you know, gotten closer to a 4 But for me, it was always like, as long as I got a 3 or higher, I'm good. And I would always just do enough, <laughs> you know. And uh, I never really struggled with school, thankfully. And I think part of that is just because how my, how adamant my mom was about school, 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 mm-hmm. school. Couldn't go outside, couldn't go to practice, couldn't do anything unless my grades were right. So, yeah, um, you know, got to give props to my mom there for just kind of setting that, setting that bar academically for me. But in terms of wrestling – I remember coming in and my goal was to be a four time undefeated national champ and looking back, it's just hilarious to think about because <laughs> my combined record, my first two years of college was 24 wins, I believe and 27 losses. I think if you combine my record, my first two years. And so, you know, whoo, lost the starting spot as a sophomore too. Didn't even, didn't even, didn't even crack the starting lineup as a sophomore. I mean, I, I did. They would switch us out for matchups because I would mm-hmm. always wrestle hard and they knew I was going to push the pace. But, um, yeah, man, it was tough because I remember I had set such a high bar and had such high expectations for myself. And, man, reality just kind of smacks you in the face. And when it does, <laughs> it's not pleasant, man. And I just remember thinking, like, wow, this is not – happening the way I envisioned this to happen. And you kind of have to sit there and reevaluate, like, am I not good? Or is this just that hard? Can (laughs) I, can I, can I actually do this? Or is this me getting in my own head? Like you have this, these crazy amount of thoughts to just start flooding into your mind that you have to now figure out, how to sift through and juggle and in addition to all the physically demanding and academically demanding workload that you have on your plate already. And now the mental game just becomes a huge part of the process. And yeah, it was tough, man, for sure. I remember freshman year thinking like, man, I wonder if I quit, if I could walk onto the football team, you know, and just like, (laughs) you know, so it's like, because I, I, was, I was definitely going to stay an athlete, right? But I just remember thinking, like, man, it, it was tough, man, for sure. But the one thing that I, I can say I never did was I never settled. And mm-hmm. um, I never lowered the goal that I had for myself or the expectations that I had for myself. After freshman year, not even qualifying for the national tournament, I was like, all right, the goal is three-time national champ. And then after sophomore year, losing the starting spot because I lost my wrestle up. Okay, the goal is two-time national champ. And then after my redshirt junior year being round of 12 and losing the blood round, I was like, all right, I got one year left. Time to be a one-time national champ. <laughs> you know, and so just staying adamant and persistent and, and just the biggest thing is just not giving up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm I'm obviously very familiar with that coaching staff that you had. You know, you talked about Beasley. Um, you know, Beasley's the man. You know, I love that guy as well as, you know, Coach Pop. Like, you had a really good support staff. So, you know, for me, you know, I, I obviously know how easy it is to not give up when I've been around that team. I've been around the guys that are on the team now and guys that were on that team when you were there as well. And there's it's a it's always been, like, a really good family aspect. But what types of conversations were you having as a freshman – with, you know, Kevin Jack and, and, you know, Tommy Gant and, and, you know, and Gwiz and like these guys that you have in the room, as well as these coaches that are keeping you as persistent and constant to that goal as, as you kept, right? Like what were those conversations like? Uh, depends on the person you're talking to, you know, like Gwiz, my freshman year, had just come off of his red shirt year mm-hmm. during Pat's first year. So he had yet to win a national championship. And 
obviously he was in the mix though because he had some really big wins over the summer freestyle wise. I think he had beaten Tony Nelson that summer, coming off in in some freestyle tournaments, and uh, so I think we kind of all knew like what Gwiz was on the verge of doing, and then uh, Tommy Gant uh, had just finished his first year or second year, I believe, with Pat. First year with Pat, second year in college. Uh-huh. And uh, then Kevin, I think, Kevin didn't redshirt, but he came in the year after me. So my first year, Kevin wasn't there yet. Uh-huh. And then obviously he came in, true freshman, All-American, and was a huge asset to the program. I think his second most wins in program history. But, yeah, you know, you got – three guys you asked about with three completely different personalities, you know? So yeah. the con- the conversations are different, right? Like I didn't, is- I didn't choose those guys at random. Not, not- right, right, right. <laughs> you got a guy like Tommy. I mean, Tommy was very much like, I don't care how good you are. I don't care what your record is. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you're better than me. It very much is, this is going to be a dog fight. You don't have respect for me. Well, guess what? I don't got respect for you, man. So <laughs> come see me step on this line and we'll see what, let, let's see what shakes out, you know? And so <clears throat> he used to just <clears throat> everything, just he, he would never take any type of disrespect. He didn't care if your record was better than his. He didn't care if you had more accolades, none of that. And he didn't care that he had none. It was just like mm-hmm. a mentality. Like I'm not going to take a back seat to anybody. And and with Gwiz, it was very much like very consistent. Uh, preparation was very, very good. Uh, he took care of business and um, he was focused. He was locked in. He knew what he needed to do to win and he would make sure that he was checking off those boxes. And he had an incredible process that he had figured out for himself. And one of the things that I had learned a tremendous amount from Gwiz was just one establishing a process and and then figuring out a process that works for you and i think you have part of the process that is non-negotiable right like am i taking care of my recovery is my diet good am i et cetera et cetera taking care of my sleep and and my training hard and practice and then you have part of your process like that you do before a match like what do i need to do to make sure that i'm person mentally specifically ready to go for me because what i might need mentally and psychologically and emotionally might be different from another athlete and so uh-huh. just kind of figuring out that nuance of the mental game and then uh yeah kevin kevin just had fun man everything was just very relaxed he was just himself he never took it too seriously but would always take care of business, man. He went out there and made it look easy, you know, and he, he was very relaxed with it. It was, it was a, it was like a comfort thing. He just looked comfortable out there. He looked comfortable before matches and it wasn't really something that he had to do a whole lot to feel comfortable with. It felt like, um, and so his was a very lighthearted approach, you know? And so Mm -hmm. I think it, you know, from all those guys, you know, the conversations are different, you know, so, and for me, I, I think I, I took a little bit and learned from a little bit of all those guys at different points in my career. You know, my, at the beginning of my career, it was just like, you know, yeah, I'm not going to take a back seat to anybody. I don't care if I'm not good or all. I'm going to fight you until the whistle blows. And my whole mentality was, I don't care if you beat me, but I want you to not want to wrestle me after this match, you know, and <laughs> And then, you know, with Gwiz, I used to go over to his house all the time with a notebook and just pick his brain. Like, what do you think about going into matches? What were you thinking about going into the NCAA tournament when you won the first time in the following year? What were you th- what was different about this championship from the last one? And, you know, I was just uh-huh. constantly just trying to get information that I felt like only he had because only he had done it in our program at the time. And so for me, my whole approach was just keep it simple. All right, you want to be a national champ. You got a guy in your room who's done it. Why don't you just ask him questions and do what he did? And then, uh-huh. in theory, if you're doing everything he did to win, why wouldn't you be able to do the same? And so, just kind of how I took it. And then, uh, <clears throat> I think the the fun part of it too is 
you know, with Kevin, you know, the year I won NCAAs, we were playing spike ball. Wednesday before the tournament, you know, as we're cutting weight, getting on the mat, just rolling around, getting the travel out of us. We brought the spike ball net. We're cracking jokes, having fun, and enjoying ourselves, you know. So I think I think it's a little bit of everything. But those are, I mean, yeah, the conversations were different depending on the guy. Yeah. So, you know, you're, like we said, your career was tough in the, in the beginning. And yeah. You had like under 500 and then, you know, you, you're, you're, I think you're just at 500 and then you win back your spot. You're kind of in and out of the lineup and you said it, you're like, all right, I can be a three-time champ. Okay. That's off the board. I could be a two-time champ. Nope. Can't do that anymore. I have one more shot. And in that last shot, you finally complete that goal of becoming an NCAA champion. And just like when you came in, you were under the radar going into that NCAAs. You, you know, you were a top guy for sure. I mean, you came right. in with like, I think, I think you ended your season with about three losses, right? Yeah. But you're, you're still not the guy that people are picking, right? You're right. not the, you're not the guy that everybody thinks is going to be at the top of that podium at the end of the night, but you end up getting there. What's the difference? And you just said that you pick Gwiz's brain about his NCAA championships year to year. What was the difference for you going into that last NCAA championship tournament? I think it was the year that I believed the most. Um, every year I believed in myself, but that year I almost had no doubt. I almost felt like, like I know I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a, I hope I can do this. It wasn't a, I'm going to try my best. It was a, I'm going to do this. And if it doesn't work out, it's not going to be because I didn't believe it's just going to be, that's the way the cookie crumbles. And I'll have peace about it either way, because I did everything I possibly could. I checked off every box. I turned over every stone preparation wise, mentally, um, physically, I did everything I possibly could to put myself in this position. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to do this, man. And I just refused to let anybody tell me that I wasn't. And so if there was someone that tried to <laughs> say something unintentionally or it was an outlet, like a like a, a, a media platform like Flow or Track or, or someone specific, it was just very much like the way I would rationalize it and justify it in my mind was, well, they don't know any better. They don't have a personal <laughs> relationship with me. So they don't even know what I think or what I've done. So of course they're not going to know or pick me because they don't see me day in and day out. So I understand. And it was just like, they just don't know better and they have no idea. So it was just kind of like, that's the way I rationalize it. So it never really, I never really let it bother me. It was just like, I know I'm going to do this. And the only reason these guys don't know I'm going to do this is because they just don't know me. Mm -hmm. So through all, throughout all that preparation, right? Yeah. Um, and guys talk about it all the time. You know, yeah. if unless you've been there in the finals, there's no way of truly getting your mind ready for that because it's right. one match at the end of the night mm -hmm. that you know you have all day. And oh, I think yeah. we talked about this last year when we were when we were at NCAAs when you know our suites were next to each other and we were standing there talking and you're like yeah. it was it was really hard more so because I couldn't do anything all day. I had to just kind yeah. of sit there and allow the day to kind of pass by. How did you, how did you combat that? How did you fight the, the fact that you just had to go throughout your day as if it was normal, knowing that at the end of the night, you could very well be a national champion? So to be honest, the only real like ex prior experience that I felt like I had to like lean on was my North Carolina state championship. And so like, yeah, I won the Reno tournament champions and you know, won some open tournaments. But like when I think about like, okay, this means something or there's pressure or whatever to perform, I was like, I just think about my state championship in high school. And I just remember thinking, well, what was I thinking about going to that tournament? And why do I feel like I did well? And and what did I have to do mentally to get myself ready for that finals that I felt like meant something? Because it's, yeah. it's, a, 
it in a way, obviously the magnitude of the tournament is pales in comparison. It's it's not even on the same chart. But mm -hmm. but winning a tournament that meant something at that time, at that particular moment in my life, isn't much different from competing at another tournament that means something at this particular moment in my life. And so I just remember thinking I was like <clears throat> you know blind faith right just like blind faith just believe and then surrender the outcome I, and i think it's important to have a combination of the two right like have blind faith in yourself and then know that even with blind faith there is no guarantee so have peace about the result regardless right have peace that God's still good. People still love you. Life goes on and it's not the end of the world. And sport isn't who you are. It's just what you do. And mm -hmm. that regardless of what happens, everything's going to be fine. But still have blind faith and have zero doubt that, like, you're going to do this. And so that's just kind of how I took it. I was just – I remember getting ready for my finals and I'm warming up and – I'm excited, man. I'm ready to go. I'm listening to 50 Cent, like with a pair of <laughs> headphones on. I'm just kind of getting ready. I'm doing my my warm up routine that I basically did for every single match that year. And Pat comes up to me because I had lost to Jared Hawk twice during mm -hmm. the regular season, one point match in the duel, and then like quadruple or triple overtime in the conference finals. And I remember Pat coming up to me. He's like, I like take my headphones off. He's like, we need a game plan if whatever. And I'm like, Pat, I'm good. He goes, well, if it goes, <laughs> I said, Pat, I'm good. And I put my headphones on. <laughs> I just walk away, man. I was in such a zone. And I just remember thinking like, this is the last match of my college career. I'm just going to wrestle as hard as I can. And I just want to have peace about the outcome. And so like, I was like, if I die, I die out there, man. Like yeah. I'm gonna leave it all out there, and uh, that's what I did, man. And I and I I just had had like a sense of peace going into the finals, and so I felt like even that's an advantage in itself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Were you were you counting like hours and seconds leading up to the match as you're going throughout your day? Because I think you guys weigh in at what like yeah. eleven o'clock or something like that in the yeah. morning. The match is until like seven at night. What are you doing in the hours before then? Yeah, so uh, I'm just kind of like, I'm doing my routine, man. So, like, I had this routine where I would roll out my front of my calves, the back of my calves, hamstrings, IT bands, quads, glute, back, lats. The whole, I had this whole full body, like, foam roller routine that I would do. I would cold tub every single day. And so I just wanted to make sure, what can I do to physically prepare so rather than getting caught up in like waiting, 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 I said, if I have all this time, I might as well do something productive now that's going to help me. So then I just tried to fill my time with things that were only going to prepare me better. So whether it was trying to nap or relax, like watch a TV show. Okay, boom, I did that. I still have more time. Frick, man, I wish we would just speed it up, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, well, let me roll out more then because that's not going to hurt me. I'll only feel better. So then Okay, I rolled out. I said, I still feel pretty. All right, let me cold tub. So I'd go get a, the trash can from the hotel room and fill it up with ice, fill it up my bathroom. I cold tubbed. And then I'm, at that point, I'm just like, all right, man, let's go. I'm ready to go. And so, you know, I probably went to the arena a little earlier than I should have or whatever. I can't remember exactly, but you know, I, I was excited, man. I was just excited because at that point, I felt like I had already won, man. Like I had already done what people didn't think I could do at that point. Before the mm -hmm. finals even started, the fact that I had made it to the finals, I had already proven a ridiculous amount of people wrong about what they thought I would be able to do with my wrestling career. And so, like, there was just a culmination of different emotions and feelings that I had going into that match that I felt were, like, overwhelmingly positive. You know? Yeah. And so I wanted to make sure, too, despite that, like, again, like, okay, that's cool. But that's not what you came here to do. You didn't come here to make the finals. You came here to win. And so, like, there was still a part of me throughout the day. I was running. It's like, just because you made the finals, that means absolutely nothing. You know, like, <laughs> that's kind of what my internal dialogue was. Because 
as excited as I was to already have done something that was still a huge accomplishment, it was like, that's not going to serve me well when it comes match time. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, there's just a lot, man. But yeah, that's kind of yeah. how I feel that time. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the match a little bit. When you finally get your chance to get out there and you had said you had already lost to Jared Hot a couple times that year. Did you make any adjustments or watch film or pick up on anything that you used in that finals match that you hadn't done in those two matches prior to that? Yeah, so one in the first match, I lost the point because the ref awarded him the point. He didn't score the point. And so I said, okay, okay well, don't do anything that's going to let the ref award him a point. So just minimize mistakes or errors. And so two, my thought process was, okay, well, if I did something to make the ref award him a point, it's like, okay, I lost the match. He didn't beat me. Mm -hmm. It was how I viewed the first one. And then the second one, we're in quadruple overtime, and it's like ultimate ride out, and I have him on the edge, and there's like three seconds left that the clock is winding down from the riding time that he had. And I'm like, okay, if I, if I take him back, I had like a tight waist and like a claw or like a half. If I take mm -hmm. him back and something bad happens, we're out of bounds. And then I can go back to the middle start and I can get that last like two seconds. And then if he gets up, he gets up. Cause I'll have at least one second of riding time and I'll win. Well, I sucked him back. First of all, I don't ride with a claw. I don't ride with a half and a tight waist. I don't <laughs> ride in the crab position. I suck him back. He high leg overs and steps over and reverses me. Gets a, gets a reversal. We're out of bounds. We go down and now we go back to the middle and I'm on bottom and he's on top. And I'm like, you gotta yeah. be kidding me. And so the mistake <laughs> there was like, stick to what you're good at. Keep the match within the round that you know how to wrestle in, right? Like the positions you know how to wrestle in well, keep the match there, dictate where the wrestling takes place and, and don't deviate from that. And so that's kind of, I just wanted to make sure I won. I didn't let the ref dictate the score of the match. And then two, don't deviate from the positions that you know you can win and, and don't deviate from wrestling in positions that you know you're good at. And so I just wanted to make sure I did those two things going into that finals match. Mm -hmm. So I told you about this part. This is the five questions part. Um, and, yeah. and my first question for you is, what was your first thought when you won the match? Yo, I can't believe it. <laughs> I don't know, like, <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't really remember what I was thinking. I just, yeah, I, I think that's probably what it was. I was just like, overwhelmed with all types of emotion man like it was mm -hmm. it was uh it was like a dream come true for real so yeah how did you celebrate the win most you know most guys are like oh um you know kyvin wanted ice cream uh you know david carr wanted some gummy bears like i mean maybe that's an iowa state thing that they just want junk food but you know yeah. what's a what's what did <laughs> how did you kind of celebrate your win uh so i just remember uh, throughout college, I was always joking around with my mom. I said, I'm going to win a national title. When I do, I'm going to come find you in the stands. And so, like, she don't know wrestling. She don't even know what's going on half the time. So she's, she's like, but I just remember thinking, like, that was a huge moment for me. And the fact that I got to do that with my mom and my younger brother and, and my high school coach, who were all sitting on the floor, was pretty pretty dope. Because I had said that yeah. I was going to do that. And the fact that I, I, I got the chance to do that was cool. Yeah. Um. If you weren't a wrestler, what would you be? Some other athlete in a different sport, to be, <laughs> honest, to be honest. Um, yeah. All right. Um, what's a what's a goal of yours that you have? Um, you know, maybe it's the near future. I know we talked about the Olympic cycle. Like what's a, what's the, what's that next goal that you have on your list? Well, one, it's just getting my body ready right now. That's all I can think about. And then two is just getting ready for this U S open in April and trying to set myself up to accomplish the next thing I have on my list. You know, I just, uh, turned down an opportunity that, 
it was a pretty cool opportunity. And now I feel like all my eggs are in one basket now. The ships are burned, man. So no going back. So I feel like, yeah, it's uh, it's go time between now and April 2024. So um, I'm excited about that and, and obviously making the Olympic team and then taking full, complete advantage of that opportunity when it presents itself and just making sure I'm ready when the time comes because uh, – I mean, you already know. There's no going back now. So, mm -hmm. you know that saying, yeah. burn the ships and storm the castle. I feel like that's where I'm <laughs> at right now. So, yeah. So, last last question. Um, and, you know, I feel like throughout this, there's been, you know, little nuggets of advice that, that you've kind of given. But, you know, what's what's a piece of advice? And we talked about those different conversations with teammates and coaches and stuff like that. What's a piece of advice that maybe one of them told you or your mom kind of gave you um, or that you just kind of learned throughout your journey of staying persistent that is something that, like, someone else should know? Yeah, so one thing my mom used to always tell me growing up was never let anybody tell you that you can't do something. And it, it means exactly what it says. Just mm -hmm. don't let anybody tell you that you can't do something. If you have a goal, if you have a dream, if you have a vision for your life, there's always going to be people who doubt your ability to do it. There's always going to be people who who doubt whether what, – maybe it's a business. There's going to be people who doubt the, the business model or the plan or maybe it's a career move. There's going to be people who might doubt the career move and might think like, I don't think that's a good industry. I don't think that's a good career to have. I know people who have been there and – xyz if you feel like there's a calling on your life or you feel like there's this push and, and there's it's something in your heart and it's something you're passionate about or it's a risk that you're willing to take um and and for whatever reason there's this unwavering amount of confidence that you have about this move or this decision or this goal or this dream like you're inevitably going to face doubt yourself and you're going to question it yourself mm -hmm at multiple points throughout the journey because guess what it ain't all sunshine and rainbows man this is real <laughs> life and it is hard it's hard just because you set a goal doesn't mean it's going to be a cakewalk but um there's going to be people who also doubt you and they're going to say things to you that are going to force you to have reservations about it and they're going to make you question the decision but once you make the decision one, don't look back. Two, again, don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. So there's no difference between me, Ryan, or any person who's on this podcast listening to this episode right now. It's just just don't be afraid to go all in. And then when it gets hard, don't give up. It's that simple, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right, Mock. This is always it's always great when we we get a chance to catch up and and you know shoot some text messages back and forth or run into each other in in yeah. in uh, what was it last year we were in Detroit. So yeah. you know it's always good anytime we get a chance to catch up and and kind of pick each other's brains on some different things. And you know I appreciate you coming on the podcast. I love hearing from you, and hopefully you get you know you get your body ready and everything else so that you're ready <laughs> for the open. Um, yeah. cause I know what kind of competitor you are and just, you know, so does everybody else. So hopefully we can see you out there competing at your fullest and, you know, uh, doing all the things that you want to do, but man, I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll see you very, very soon. Um, I heard I'm, I'm probably going to be hearing from you. I think you're, you're going to be on the call, right. For, for ACCs. I hear that. Cause I think yeah, it's in yeah. your, your home gym. So I think I heard yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah. So, Consi you know, semis, be... Consi finals. let's go. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> listen, Come on over into the realm of the media, Mog. We need some more, you know, <laughs> strong voices that people don't want to criticize, right? So, you know, that's always it's always great. But Mock, like I said, I appreciate it. Hopefully, get a chance to to run into you in person here again. Um, but before we go, do you got anything else for us? Nah, you're the man. I appreciate you, bro. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of the Athletes to Athletes podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. To engage with everything the A2A platform has to offer, go to the App Store and search Athletes to Athletes to download our new app. You can check out our educational material and you'll ensure that you don't miss when a new episode of the A2A podcast drops. Again, thank you for listening. We'll see you again next time.